recording. Great, let's get started. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to CS839, Special Topics in Deep Learning. Um, I'm really great to see um, all of you here, and thank you so much for your enthusiasm in this course. Uh, I hope you all had a wonderful summer break and that you are feeling uh, recharged for this semester. So I know the COVID situation has made things um, very difficult for everyone, especially for students. Um, hopefully, this won't be the case for our class, and I'm sure you will learn a lot. Uh, regardless of where you physically are uh, in this moment. So the first lecture is really about um, giving you an overview about uh, this course, what it's about, and how we run this course. And first I'll cover um, some important information uh, regarding uh, the course logistics. And second, I'll briefly um, give you an overview on some of those uh, research topics that we will be exploring together and why they're interesting. And depending on how the time goes, um, hopefully we will have some um, time left in the end for uh, intro so that you guys can get to know everyone. So first I'll talk about uh, logistics. Um, by the way, feel free to uh, raise your hand and ask question any anytime during this lecture. You can use this, uh, I think the raise hand button uh, at the bottom uh, on your screen. And if at any point the audio is not clear, also feel free to kind of raise hand, let, let me know. So I would like to start with a quick introduction about myself because I think this context and background can help you understand and appreciate hopefully you know, how the score syllabus is formed. So I did my um, PhD back at Cornell and graduated in 2017. Uh, after that, I went to industry and worked at Facebook AI for about uh, two years. Uh, after you know the fun journey there, um, I decided to come back to academia and spent uh, another year at Stanford University as a postdoc. So the reason I tell you this because um, I think my experiences in both industry and academia has sort of shaped my view and research, and also, of course, this course um, as well. So in fact, many topics that are covered in this course are not only interesting from a fundamental perspective, but also meaningful and relevant from a practical point of view. And to me, I have been really appreciate this uh, kind of mentality of thinking, looking at things from uh, both angles, and I think my career has uh, immensely benefited from this um, kind of thinking mode. And I really hope to kind of bring this uh, mentality to uh, this course as well. Um, and here's my um, email address. Um, I highly recommend um, that you uh, use Piazza Forum for um, the questions uh, because the course staff and I will be. Um, actively uh, look in the forum and uh, answer your questions. And if there are things that are more kind of directed at me individually, uh, you can email uh, Sharon Lee at cs.risk.edu. And please make sure to include CS839 in the subject title so that I can, you know, uh, easily manage. Okay, I assume everything is clear. Um, and let me move on to this topic overview. So I wanna show you like um, about these individual topics we'll be exploring together during the semester and why I think those are um, interesting. So here I'm listing uh, in total seven uh, different themes or topics that will be exploring together during this course. And for every topic here, each one will be covered by a mixture of 
lecture, um, which I'll typically, you know, try to present, give you an overview about this topic and how different pieces of research uh, fit together. And followed by several paper presentations, which you will be signing up today. And the purpose of the present, uh, presentation is to kind of go deeper and doing a deep dive on individual um, papers. So hopefully with this structure, you will be getting um, both the breadth and in-depth um, knowledge about this, um, each of these topics. So the first topic will be on um, the evolution of uh, neural network architectures. So looking at the history of um, deep learning, I think the evolution of neural network architectures is an essential part of this picture. So for example, 10 years ago, if you wanted to build a computer program to distinguish between cats versus dogs by just looking at the photographs, we could only do so with pretty lousy accuracy. And in the past several years, the research community has made tremendous amount of progress by using uh, deep neural networks. And I'm sure this is what attracted you to this course as well. So for example, we've seen better and better model architecture design, which proves the classification accuracy over time. And this is now what powers um, image recognition on your phone, and this is what powers Google Translation um, when you go and use it online. So real tools that we rely on on a daily basis are powered by these um, deep neural networks. So in the next lecture, I will go uh, a bit more detail and show you how these neural networks are constructed and how they evolve and change from one to the other. So for example, uh, Lynette here, um, the first one here is sort of considered as the first um, convolutional neural networks invented. And then AlexNet, which came out in 2012, uh, made this breakthrough in ImageNet competitions. And ResNet um, is um, viewed as this breakthrough uh, in depth, which allows us to train uh, neural networks with uh, more than hundreds of um, layers, which is incredible. And the last one, uh, DenseNet, which was um, developed by my colleagues by the Cornell, um, was um, received the CVPR Best Paper um, Award two years ago, um, which you know we'll be dedicating uh, one paper presentation slot for this one uh, in our um, in our very first paper presentation next week. So I'm very excited about those. And if you look at all of these neural network architectures, the commonality of e each of those network is that they are all um, manually engineered by human experts. And it can take years of trial and errors um, to get things right. And you have, you know, have the right kind of insights uh, built into these networks. So for example, Lynette was uh, invented in 1988, um, and AlexNet came out around 2012. And in between those two, it took four years of gap. And then it took another three years for um, residual networks to come out. So this process can sometimes you know, be slow. And this motivated um, this field of um, AutoML. Um, where you know researchers, especially you know a team at Google, has been heavily investing in this direction, um, where the goal is to replace the role of human expert and let the machines do the search. So basically, uh, the algorithm uh, running under the hood is searching in this um, gigantic space of neural network configurations and return the optimal one. So in the, in the second uh, paper presentation slot, we will have a, uh, a paper dedicated to, um, to this topic on automatic neural network architecture search, which will be exciting. 
Let's move on to the second topic here, which is trustworthy deep learning. And um, I'll be covering three subtopics uh, underneath. Um, the first one is out of distribution reliability, which um, my lab has been um, primarily focusing on this topic. I personally um, am very excited about this topic. So I would like to motivate um, this problem in this following scenario. So imagining yourself hoping to um, develop a phone app that can automatically recognize um, the uh, the pictures of food taken. So you can, you know, it, the, the app might show you some nutrition information and maybe some possible recipes you can make with it. And this can come very handy, especially during this COVID time, especially for people like me who's been struggling with cooking, right? So to do so, you collect some training data and train on your favorite neural network architecture and you end up getting this food image classifier, right? Well, we think you are done with all the work. More work has just begun. And why do I say that? Because in a closed world setting, you would imagine, you know, when you deploy this app uh, in the real world, you put on the app store, you would expect the users to, you know, take pictures just to look like your training data. And this is the closed world setting where we assume the training and testing data distributions match each other. However, the reality is closer to an open world setting where the training and testing data might very likely to differ from each other. And so, in fact, this real world data can be anything, right? You can imagine beyond what you expect. And this is one uh, of the most important I've learned during my um, industry experience. So for example, um, you might get a picture of a bird that goes into your uh, food image classifier. And in this scenario, you should ideally identify this input to be somewhat strange, right? Uh, your network should be um, flagging this image to be uh, anomaly or out of distribution. Uh, instead of classifying into one of your food classes. And this problem of out of distribution reliability is even more um, crucial, especially for those safety critical applications. Um, for example, identify COVID from regular pneumonia chest x-rays or in uh, Thomas driving, uh, identify unexpected objects on the street so that the model can take uh, early inventions and precaution. So it's very useful in those scenarios. And the second subtopic um, is adversarial robustness, um, which is also gaining a lot of retention, uh, attention these days in the research community. Um, so to give you an example, here we have an input image um, which is predicted as a panda by a neural network. And research found, um, especially from a publication by Ian Goodfellow et al., they demonstrated that it's possible to add this small human imperceptible uh, noise perturbations to your input image. And then you could actually tweak this manipulate this prediction uh, made by this neural network to be something totally bizarre and irrelevant to Panda. For example, this one is um, after the noise perturbation, it's predicted as Gibbon, right? So this could be very concerning, especially when uh, you're dealing, uh, when you're deploying this machine learning models um, without uh, being robust to some of these um, noise perturbation. So we'll talk about, you know, um, there are some defense mechanisms out there that enables uh, this robustness, especially in security critical kind of applications. And the third subtopic um, is um, fairness and uh, group robustness. So fairness is also becoming very important these days. And the first question you want to ask is, you know, why do we care about fairness? 
the main motivation is because it's highly relevant related to our own benefits. For example, employers are now using machine learning systems to, um, to select job candidates. And you don't want to kind of um, be unfairly treated in the select process, right? So artificial intelligence has uh, become really powerful, but it can also be used incorrectly, especially because machine learning models um, heavily rely on the data. And this model that we're training is only objective if uh, in the sense that how a human teach the model, right? So if the data um, that we use to train the model is inherently biased, um, the model would end up looking on some of these, for example, biased signal uh, in this example here. So let's say you wanted to train uh, uh, a hair um, prediction model using uh, images of human faces, right? So it turns out in your training data, there's a lot of images. Um, there's a lot of images um, has this implicit association between female and the attribute of blonde hair, and male are always often associated with dark hair, right? So this machine would basically learn the source correlation between the label and the gender. So if you test this model on uh, this rare kind of association, a male with blonde hair, it might throw out kind of a lower um, accuracy um, for this rare examples, right? This is um, very undesirable. So we'll talk about how we can um, design more fair uh, machine learning algorithms to mitigate some of those issues. And the third topic is on uh, interpretable deep learning, um, which is really fun because you get to see a lot of cool visualizations. So I wanted to cultivate using this um, XKCD comic here. Um, probably a lot of you have seen this before. So this guy is um, asking question, is this your machine learning system? And the guy answered, yep. You pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra and then collect the answers on the other side. And then this person asked, what if the answers are wrong? And the guy responded, just stir the pile until it starts looking right. right? So obviously this is, you know, this is not the true reflection of the scientific process. So an ideal word, right, to give you a big picture of why interpretability matters, you know, at the very bottom, uh, we're, um, we're observing this word, right? Then based on some of the observations, um, you derive and collect data from um, this, from the real world, and then you train a black, back, black box model from the data that you collected. So once the model is uh, trained, um, we like to you know, extract um, some interpretability um, and how especially communicating to human about why the machine learning model is making certain predictions, right? So it's kind of serving as a interface. It's bridging, right? Uh, bridging this communication between human and a black box model, which is very important and crucial. And another aspect to think about why interpretability matters in deep learning is, you know, from this what and why trade-off perspective. So I remember attending, I think two years ago, when I was attending a New York uh, symposium on this um, very interesting debate. I think Yan Le Kuen was on the panel as well, and so was my um, co-advisor, Ken Wimberger. So they were you know, debating on whether interpretability matters in, in this kind of more than deep network setting. And I think a very interesting way to look at this is it really depends. When it comes to predictive modeling, you have to make this trade-off, right? Do you just do you just care to know, you know, what is predicted? For example, when you're, you know, let's say Netflix is making movie recommendations to um, all the users, um, 
you probably you know just care about you know what movies should I recommend to the users and not so much about you know why I why why I um, why this recommendation is made. Um, but in other settings, um, this why might matter, right? So um, you pr perhaps wanted to know you know why this uh, machine learning uh, you want to kind of learn more about the problem and the data and the reasoning behind this uh, learning process. And so a critical setting where um, interpretability matters um, is, for example, in healthcare, uh, when you're, let's say, training a classifier to predict um, whether this patient has cancer or not. Um, and when you're communicating this uh, prediction to the doctors, the doctors will be you know, we'll be curious and they will ask, uh, question this machine learning model, you know, why this prediction was derived. Um, so I would say it's, it depends a lot on the locations and task at hand. Um, and we'll dive deeper into um, those techniques later on in the semester. And one of the papers, for example, we will, um, will present during this course is called Grand Cam, which is a very popular, widely used techniques for visualizing and um, showing you know, what part of this image is associated with the final predictions. So for example, this is the original picture where you um, there is a, a dog and a cat sitting together. And when a machine uh, is making a prediction on the cat, and you can see that this technique is able to highlight and visualize this area, um, which uh, is informative about you know where the cat is actually located. And this bottom row shows um, the visualization uh, for this dog prediction, um, and you can see they provide more finer grained information about how this label is derived, more than just a pure kind of final prediction. And the fourth topic we'll be exploring is on deep learning generalization theory. Um, and especially for those of you um, more interested on the theoretical side. Um, so there has been this mystery, you know, in, uh, in deep learning. If you're looking from the perspective of classic machine learning um, theory, um, there is, you know, um, there is this um, notion of as you increase the complexity and the capacity of your model. Your model is more likely to enter this overfitting regime, right? So this U-shaped curve is the classic uh, learning theory. However, in a lot of the steep networks that we're using today, it's overcapacited. Um, res residual networks, for example, can have hundreds of millions of parameters, um, but certainly they're not, you know, overfitting to um, the task in hand. So in some of those um, presentations, uh, we'll try to demystify, you know, why deep networks, despite being um, over, um, over um, parameterized, they can still generalize well uh, in this learning tasks. And the fifth topic um, is uh, on learning with less supervision, which I also think it's a rising, um, rising field um, for this community. So if we look at this entire spectrum of levels of supervision, a lot of these papers um, have been focusing on this fully supervised regime. So for example, many of you probably have heard about ImageNet, right? It has over a million um, images fully annotated. So each image is essentially sent to uh, the human annotators and you mark what those labels are among the thousand different classes. And it takes hundreds of thousands of human hours to be able to devise a data set like this. And it's certainly valuable, right? But this entire process of annotation is too expensive to afford. So there has been um, a research effort on weekly supervised uh, learning, which tries to 
push this to somewhere in the middle, right? So for example, uh, some of my work at Facebook has been uh, trying to look at how we can leverage um, the data that is publicly available on the internet, um, where users, for example, on Instagram may provide a hashtag for a certain picture. And those hashtags are not perfect. They might contain noise, right? And they might also have a missing label problem. For example, given this picture of cats and dogs, user may only provide a hashtag of, you know, a cat without a dog. But despite this uh, large amount of noise inherent in this uh, data set, um, a paper um, that we published at ECCV showed that the model can learn, you know, surprisingly um, highly generalizable features. And if we use Instagram uh, pre-trained neural networks as initialization to, you know, fine tune on some of those um, benchmarks, for example, ImageNet, um, it's able to reduce the top one accuracy by up to 2%, which is very significant. So this is, this certainly has been um, promising in terms of solving this data scarcity issue. But ultimately, you know, the world has to move towards this direction of um, self-supervised learning or unsupervised learning. Now, ideally, you know, you should be able to, or the model wants to just take the images in the wild without relying on uh, human supervision, annotation, and just learn by itself using the patterns behind. And this idea is closer to this kind of true notion of artificial intelligence, right? So we'll be having uh, one uh, paper presentation slot uh, on this topic of self-supervised, um, unsupervised learning. And uh, this next topic um, will be on uh, lifelong learning. So the idea is very appealing, right? Uh, we are hoping that the machines can improve with experience and becomes uh, smarter over time. So for example, uh, imagine a self-driving car is you know, heading on the road. It might encounter new road conditions and different objects and so on, right? So ideally, this should be, um, this self-driving car should be adapting to different uh, conditions and environments and uh, becomes more accurate um, over time. And this is also kind of aligned with the previous um, idea that I mentioned on the open world learning. Um, basically, the more realistic setting is that machine learning models will be deployed uh, in this um, chain and constantly evolving environments without being static, right? So this this notion again, this closed world setting of training data and data match uh, each other, this will no longer hold in a lot of these realistic scenarios. And lifelong learning is also kind of fitting in that problem setting. So we'll look at some of those topics. And uh, lastly, um, I know some of I've seen the survey results. Um, some of you are pretty excited about this uh, deep generative modeling, um, which is quite fascinating. So this is a visualization that shows you know, how this field of generating face images has progressed, advanced in the past 4.5 years. Right? So if you look back, I think this middle image, um, this is when I was still in graduate school. And back then, you know, I was already pretty astonished by some of these face images generated by GANs. And years later, I see that the pictures has, you know, have become sharper with higher resolution, very real, right? So if you go to this website, uh, which is whichfaceisreal.com, you can see a lot of these faces that are synthesized by uh, deep learning models, um, but they don't actually exist in the real world, right? So this is, I think this is very fascinating to me. Um, and then aside from synthesizing faces, deep neural networks, um, these generative models have also been very powerful in, for example, style transfer. Um, for example, you can um, 
take a picture and then apply some of your favorite artistic styles and uh, end up getting this really cool kind of um, stylish photographs. And um, you know, we'll look at some of those uh, techniques as well. So that's you know pretty much all I have for uh, the topic overview. Um, I won't uh, overwhelm you guys with the, the technical details because we have a whole semester um, to you know to to learn about those. Let me see how we're doing in time. So looks like we have 15 minutes.